Well, hello. This is actually take three of my Thrive Like a Parent podcast for, I guess you could say this week. I started it and then I was like, nope, scratch that, start over. (laughs) And then the second time I literally was on a roll and everything went out. And yesterday I lost internet for like hours from like 12 in the afternoon. Oh, please don't do it again because it's about 12 right now until about seven at night. And so I had to cancel my clients and I don't have great cell service in the house. So I like, I literally, I couldn't do anything. And the craziest part is that you really realize how tethered you are to the internet. And this is so not the topic today, but I'm going to keep going with it for a second. I was talking to Carter a few weeks ago and I was like, you know, what would be a really cool documentary is if someone did an entire year without the internet and like, what, what would you do? Like, how would you find places you like you wouldn't have Google Maps. I'm pretty sure they don't print the yellow and white pages anymore. Like how would you find where to go? Like crazy. I think it would be absolutely crazy. But anyway, we can have a whole nother conversation on the internet another day because it is definitely a hate love relationship. And I've hinted to you about it a little bit of just my relationship with the internet and Instagram and all the different things. But today <laughs> Two minutes in today, let me tell you what the topic is going to be. The topic of today that I really want to touch base with you on is boundaries with our kids. And some of you listening to this might get really pissed off at me and be like, basically, fuck you and disagree with me. You might think I'm wrong. You might think that I don't know what I'm talking about. You may decide to not listen to my advice anymore. And the reason I'm saying that is because I do feel that boundaries within parenting is a very controversial topic at the moment within our generation. And the reason for that is there has been so much push and there has been so much marketing and advertising on the idea of conscious and gentle parenting. Now, I do believe that we need to make sure that our children are able to know that it's okay to verbalize their feelings. I am like the hugest proponent for that. And I do believe that before our time, past generations or when you and I were growing up, males especially were, you know, not encouraged to share their feelings and same with females. And now we're in a space of share, share, share. Like it's okay to share your feelings. It's okay to have your feelings. It's okay to cry. It's okay to this. It's okay to that. All of that is okay. And I'm not saying it's not. I believe that in the beginning, foundational years of a child's life, when they are very, very young, up until six, let's say, We need to support their emotional intelligence and allow them to know and build that connection with them, build that nurture piece for our children. And how do you do that? Asking them how they feel, giving them a voice, giving them their autonomy. I've spoken so much about this on other podcasts, but I think what's being lost in translation in terms of gentle and conscious parenting is there is still room for boundaries and there is still room for natural consequences. And there is still room to be able to be the parent, be a nurturing parent, but be a parent, meaning you may not love this, but meaning you are in control. What happens, and there's research coming out on this, and I'll tell you about a study in a little bit, but there's so much research coming out about more passive parenting and therefore the parent is not the one in control. And let me tell you what ends up happening when there are no boundaries for behavior within a home for children. What ends up happening is down the road, those children will have mental health issues. And that may feel like a very strong statement, but that is hands down what I believe that is hands down what a lot of other very well-known forefront psychology, neurology individuals believe and are really starting to preach. And I feel like I would be doing you a disservice and an injustice if I didn't say, hey, I need you to hear from someone and give you permission almost to hold boundaries with your children. 
Now, let me tell you the beautiful part about boundaries from a neurological level so that you don't feel guilty or shame or whatever when you hold boundaries with your children. When you hold boundaries with your children, that is the way that their brain learns. They know that that is the line and they know that they cannot go any farther. Or if you hold a boundary of, I need you to brush your teeth, make your bed, put in, push in your drawers, put away your dirty clothes before coming downstairs for breakfast every single day. And if you don't, then ding, 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 there's a consequence. Yes, it may seem like Pavlov-ish, like almost like training a dog, right? But what ends up happening is that will become automatic. It will become automatic because you expect those things from your child. And the beautiful part about that is when it becomes automatic, brushing our teeth, making our bed, putting our clothes away, pushing our drawers in, turning out the lights, all the different things, it then allows more space for the brain to learn the next thing because it becomes autopilot. Have you ever driven in the car and you're like, how the hell did I get here? Because you were daydreaming or thinking about something else, but your brain was on autopilot. It's because you've already taught your brain to drive there, or you've already done it enough to get to work, or you know how to drive, right? Ex specifically, right? So autopilot is a beautiful thing and boundaries allow for that autopilot. And so I don't want you to feel like you are hurting your child emotionally by placing boundaries. I think the biggest piece of this for you is to know you get to decide what is okay and what is not okay in your home. And I don't want you to make that decision based on a lens of if you are emotionally hurting your child. And what I mean by emotionally hurting is, oh, I hurt their feelings. Like, oh, they're going to be so sad. Like things like that. We don't want to emotionally neglect our children or, or, like abuse that, like we're not talking about that, right? We're just saying it's okay that our children don't get their way. It is okay that you decide what is best for you because what ends up happening is long-term, they won't respect your authority. They'll say, fuck you, and they will go do the thing that you don't want them to do when they're teenagers. And then they'll get into all kinds of things because you don't have the authoritative role over your child. I'm not saying that I need you to be a dictator, but I do want your children to know who is boss. And a really perfect example of this, and I hear this so often from parents, is my child, and there's two types of kids, so I'll explain the other one too. My child is an angel at school. My child has never gotten in trouble at school. My child saves all of it for when they come home. And they make my life a living hell. And they're like a tornado in my home. They run the home. We walk on eggshells around my child. And my child has tantrums and meltdowns and just is wreaking havoc on my life. Now, if that's your child, what that tells me is that your child has the ability to keep it together and can. And that means that that child understands the authoritative roles in which teachers and leaders play at school. They understand if I mess up, I'm going to get in trouble and I don't want to get in trouble. So if your child is behaving at school, that tells me automatically it's not that they can't at home, it's that they won't. And I want you to hear that, like really hear that. It's not that they can't do it, it's that they won't. It's that they're choosing not to. And it is really hard to break that cycle once they know they can get away with it. Now, there are some children who, and I work with a lot of these parents, there are some children who are so brilliant at calculating. I'm not going to say manipulate, but they are so brilliant at calculating the situation of like, they're like, they're literally brilliant. They will be phenomenal in leaders in their older ages, right? In adult years. But for you, if they are living in your home, you are effing exhausted and, and growing more wrinkles and hair by, by the minute because of these children, right? We need to be able to hold consistent boundaries of if this is what's going to happen, then these are, these are the steps that are going to be taken next. And so what you can do is almost like an eye for an eye. Let's say your child tantrums for 30 minutes. Well, your child owes you 30 minutes. I don't care if your child owes you 30 minutes of chores. I don't care if your child owes you 30 minutes of just sitting 
hanging out with you while you're, I don't know, cutting your fingernails or you're, you're doing something right. Like an eye for an eye, meaning you interrupted my time and took time out of my day. And so now you're going to give that time back to me and they will start, but it has to be consistent and they will start to understand, Ooh, that doesn't feel good. I want to be able to tantrum and make your life a living hell. And I want to be able to get what I want because what ends up happening is, and I have a strong-willed child, but what ends up happening is you become so exhausted from trying to hold the line and, and trying to place the boundary and you just simply can't do it anymore and you break. And so then like, uh uh-huh, there, there it is. I know I know where the line is. Like I know where I know I can still push it. I know I can still get to where I need to get to. I know I can still get my way. And the more we allow that and the older they get, the more they will understand that if they just push hard enough, they will get their way. Now, there is another type of child, the child who is misbehaving at school, but maybe is a pleasure at home or the one who is misbehaving at school and misbehaving at home, meaning does not respect any authority, does not understand what it means to have leadership within the home or at school. And that needs to be put in place. And this is not to where our children fear us. I am not saying that. We're not screaming. We're not spanking. We're we're not we're not doing any of that. You can literally do it with comedy of like, well, you know, you, you, cho- you chose, you chose to do that. So gosh, I guess we're going to have to do this. Like you can literally make it almost sarcastic, if you will, to, to lighten the mood. Because when I work with parents who have children who defy boundaries so so effortlessly, if you will, and they are so brilliant and so calculating and so smart. There is so much, as they get older, there is so much resentment and anger within the parents because they just want their child to behave. They just want their child to stop causing such turmoil in the home. And I believe that there's, from what I've seen, I believe that there's parents who end up giving up and you're not, you're not wrong for giving up. You're fucking exhausted, but you're giving up because you just can't do it anymore. And I actually have seen clients who are grown adults who hands down were that way as children, and they still have those traits that are needing to be broken of, I've always got my way. I always know how to calculate the situation. I always know how to be the leader and, and be in control because that is what's feeling good and best for their brain. But it is extremely difficult to maintain relationships when that is the result as an adult. It is extremely difficult because if you're the one who always has to be in control or always has to be the leader, it doesn't always work. We need our children to be able to understand it is a beautiful thing if you're a leader. It's a beautiful thing if you're a follower. It's a, both of those things are healthy. And leadership is not dictatorship. I'm a leader within my business, but I'm not a dictator. And if I was a dictator, guarantee you, people would be like, F you, I'm not working for you. I'm out the door. Like, that's not cool. So we have to be able to teach our, our children boundaries are healthy. Boundaries are beautiful. Boundaries are okay. I believe that in parenthood, we care so much about our children that somehow we get lost into believing that it should be more about our children than about us. And I believe that it's about both of us, both. There are certain things like you can have rules, like you can have specific things within your home where you're like, this is a no, like that's not going to work for me at a certain age. When my children were younger, I mean, I've, I'm sure I've heard it. it it's been many years because my kids are seven and 10. But from my strong-willed one, I definitely heard, I hate you or something. You know, I've heard that before. And I was like, all right, we'll talk about that later. But okay, like you're definitely dysregulated right now. So we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna talk about that one later. But at a certain age, I decided, nope, like, mm-mm. Like you are old enough to understand if you're using those words and I know you know what that means. I don't want to be told that I take care of you. There's a roof over your head. I'm 
clothing you, I'm feeding you. And I don't hold that against them. I'm not like, these are the reasons I clothe you and I feed you. Like I don't guilt them into it. But for me, it's, yeah, no, mm, I'm working hard here to give you the life that I want to give you. It's my choice to give you this certain life of how I want this to go. But I'm not going to, I'm not going to be treated like that because I wouldn't allow a partner to treat me like that. I wouldn't allow a partner to hit me. I wouldn't allow a partner to speak to me inappropriately. I wouldn't allow a partner to disrespect me. And I'm certainly not going to disrespect, hit, or talk down to my partner. And so it's teaching mutual respect. Now, there was a study done with about 10,000 families, and they were looking at two-dimensional types of parenting. There was firm versus permissive, and there was hostile versus loving. And they looked at the outcome of those parenting styles. And so it ended up being firm and loving, firm and permissive, firm and hostile, permissive and hostile. They, they did all the different clumps together, if you will. The worst outcome of mental health for children who were raised in the home was hostile and permissive, which means you are maybe projecting your anger onto your children or there's just a hostile environment as well as you are a permissive parent, meaning you aren't holding boundaries. The next one was loving and permissive, which means you're giving them the nurture, but you're also giving them the space to do way too much, way too soon, way too early. And those were the top two that had negative outcomes. What I believe is the best outcome for your child is firm and loving. You give the nurture, but you also hold the boundaries. And what I want the loving nurture to look like, and the research has showed that the best type of nurture is through touch. So just touch your child on the shoulder. If you feel like you've been really firm and holding boundaries for the day, throw in a little hug here and there or you know, just, just a little rub on the back or, you know, holding of a hand, their brain will signal that touch of this is love. So you can be firm and still offer nurture within your home, love in your home through the form of touch. And of course, words. But if we are having conversation after conversation after conversation, because you think that having these conversations, you're going to get through to your child. What I would say is back off on the words. What I always say is less compliance, less words. Don't waste your energy, set a firm boundary and move forward. And if they don't respect that boundary, let's say, because you could be listening to this and be like, yeah, right. If I give them a, if I give them a natural consequence, they're not going to do it. If they don't do it, that is still not holding a boundary. So therefore, maybe we add another consequence on. Maybe we say, okay, I needed you to do the dishes because you X, Y, Z'd. And then that took 20 minutes for you to even do the consequence that I gave you. So now I need you to take out the trash. Easy, simple. Okay, well, I need, oh, bummer. You must really want to do the laundry today, huh? What a bummer. What a bummer. There is a client that we've had in the past and their child was a 12 year old female still wearing pull-ups at night and she had a cell phone she had an ipad and it was very much more of a permissive household and understandably so the parents were exhausted they were both working full-time they were trying to make sure to keep a roof over their head. Like there's reasons why we have gotten to the the place of throwing an iPad in front of our kids' faces because we're so effing exhausted and trying to keep up with everything that this world is requiring of us. There was nothing wrong with her physically. Nothing, like she'd been to the doctor. There's nothing wrong. She just still wore pull-ups at night and they wanted to learn how to hold that boundary because they were having to continue to do laundry and all the different things and the room was smelling and all this stuff. And so what I said was, okay, let's work on this. If we, first of all, we're going to take away the pull-ups and she also didn't really, she was okay wearing them and she would go to sleepovers and wear them, but 
she was hiding them when she would take them off because she was embarrassed and things like that. And so I said, we're going to put her in underwear. Like we're done with, we're done with pull-ups. We're, we're 12. We're done. If there's nothing wrong with her on a medical side, we're done. And every time we wet our bed, we're going to do the, the sheets and she's going to do them. Not you. She is. And the first time she was like, okay, fine. The second time she was like, oh God, this is a pain to like pick this up and do all this. The third time she was like, ugh, stopped wearing pull-ups within a week. No more wetting the bed. But it's because we held a boundary. And it's not that she couldn't do it. It is not that she couldn't do it. It's that the boundary wasn't set and then delivered. I know that there are so many wounds that we as parents have from our parents. And I believe that more than ever before in this life, it is okay to own those wounds. It is okay to own the triggers. It is okay to own the trauma. It is okay to own our past of like, I want to do things differently. I don't want to do that. But I do believe that we have fear of doing the same thing. And so we're really trying to ramp up the nurture and, and give the love and, and let them have a voice and all the different things. My children have a voice. My children know, hands down, they know that I will always listen. And I will say that I was more the nurturer and sometimes even Jonathan's boundary setting made me uncomfortable when I was a younger parent, way younger, and doing tons of research as the boys grew up. And then being a solo parent, knowing that I needed to get this in line. And I, I, was, I was mom and dad. I am mom and dad. Still, Carter has helped in so many ways, but he's not always here. I will never forget, it was two years ago, so it was probably in my first year of grief, maybe right after the first year, maybe it was like within the second year. I almost mourned the old parent that I was, and I missed that parent. I missed the parent who was just able to be like, oh, honey, it's okay, here's a Band-Aid. Like, I missed being able to be that passive, loving, nurturing parent. Because as my children got older, it was require me, requiring me to step up and give them what they needed and hold them accountable for their actions. And I know that if I don't do it now, I know that I will have to deal with it later. I know, like, I just know that. And one of my kiddos, like I said, is really strong will. The other one has been a piece of cake, but one of them has literally given me a run for my money. Like, whoo. Like, like I feel you, you are not alone in all of this conversation and boundary setting isn't easy. It requires more effort when you are exhausted. When I am done working for the day, my, my work, my job, and I leave this room, I am putting on a second hat. And for the first few years after Jonathan passed, I didn't have all that energy to give to the kids. And so in some ways I'm I have been very slowly making up for lost time of holding certain boundaries that I needed to do. I didn't have the emotional energy to make sure that they, I don't know, made their beds. I didn't have the emotional energy to make sure that they pushed in their drawers. I didn't have the emotional energy to make sure they cleaned up after themselves in their playroom upstairs. Like I didn't have it. I just didn't, but I do now. And so I hold myself accountable to saying, this is how I want my household to be run. This is how I want my house to look. This is how I want things to go. And so the only way it's going to get there is if I request that of them and teach them, not in a mean way, not in an angry way, not in a resentful way, but hold boundaries with what is expected within this household. And therefore they will understand who's the boss. And it's okay for there to be a leader in your home. Like it is okay. They are young. I, I really believe that this gentle and conscious parenting, not all the aspects of gentle and conscious parenting are bad, by the way. Not all of the concepts are bad. I'm not knocking and saying F that shit. Like I'm not doing that. But I, I do believe that it's, it's trying to build this symbiotic relationship with one another of we're all equal. And I do believe that we need to create that as our children get older. And I do believe that we can create that even in their 
later teen years, if you, if you feel that they have learned what they need to learn, like it can be very young. It can even be a transition in high school as they're almost heading off to college of like releasing, right? But in, in those formative years, they need to understand what it looks like to have a leader, a strong leader within their home, because they may not always be the boss. They may not always be the entrepreneur. Like they may not always, like they may have a job, like they may have a job with a boss. And if you have taught them that it's always okay to lead and they've never learned how to follow, literally like they learn in kindergarten to get on the line and follow the leader down to recess, they won't know how. And these are, these are important. You're, you may be like, yeah, 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 they get that. Like, that's fine. But they may not, especially if they're ones who are being so headstrong and stubborn and calculating within your home. They may not understand how to follow. They may not understand the role of, I would like for you to sit and eat your meal. We're not turning on the TV tonight for dinner. And then there's a like cue meltdown and then you don't want to deal with the meltdown. So you turn the damn TV on and, oh, I'm going to say it. You're going to be so pissed at me. I'm, you, oh. <sighs> You're probably already pissed at this whole podcast, but I only say it because I love you and I only say it because I really do care. And I've seen the repercussions when we don't. And it really is mental health struggles. I was recently on vacation with all five of us, with Carter and his daughter and my kids. And guys, like they were, we were on vacation, okay? And you're going to be like, stop judging people because everyone has something negative to say or about whatever someone says. But I walk into this restaurant and we go sit down none of my children bought iPads. Lila did not bring an iPad. Like no one brought iPads. We were there to be together. And I'm looking at this table. The dad is eating his food on his phone, watching a sports game. The daughter, there was two daughters and a mom. The daughter, I was like, oh, that's nice. Dad's like, okay. But then the daughter was on a phone and then the mom was on a phone. And those, those humans don't suck. Like, like, let's like be clear. I'm not saying these humans are terrible humans. So like, let's get that out of the way. But that is so typical for our society these days. And I've pointed it out before in stories and I've gotten bashed and ripped apart of like shame on me for like judging those people. But we need to teach communication. We need to teach how to be together. If you go on vacation and all your child wants to do is head up to the hotel room and, and, and play, I don't know, Roblox or whatever the hell those things are like that. Like what? you're on vacation. Like you're at a pool, like you're at a beach. Like what? Like what? Right. Where are our priorities? Right. And so it is okay to hold boundaries in whatever way you want your family life to look like. Yes, I've given you a few opinions of my own today of things that I don't necessarily feel are, are needed, like watching phones at, at meals. It's one thing if these kids are 10, it's another thing if they're, you know, five months and you're like, I just need a meal. Like, there's always a, re like, I get it. Like I, I did that when my kids were really, really young, but now that they're communicating and talking, like I want to talk to them at meals. I want to have conversations with them. So the bottom line is I'm going to recap for you is you can have boundaries with love. You can have firm parenting style with nurture. If you are a softy and you are wildly uncomfortable if you have a heteronormative relationship and you have a male and that male is really strong and it makes you wildly uncomfortable you know what i say to that you're lucky because you have a balance you get the nurture and the firm and i believe that so many of us are trying to strip that firm away because it makes us feel so uncomfortable and in the beginning it made me feel uncomfortable like i said but it's so needed, especially as my children have gotten older and they're 10 and seven. So I hope you still love me. I know I've given lots of caveats of like, you might not like this. You might not like this, but you know, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't these days with everything you say. And I'm going to say it no matter what, but I, I want you to know that I am very cognizant of the fact that it may not be the most loved topic or it may not be the most agreed upon outlook if you will. But I do believe that for the brain, boundaries and nurture is the way to go. 
and both are needed and both can be present and it's okay to lead it's okay to lead the pact so until next time xoxo dr b